Welcome back to another episode of Cyclone Insiders. Matt Van Winkle, Sam Turner, and Dean Burhaugal joining us to talk a little bit about football here. In that third segment, we're going to talk about some Iowa State volleyball with our volleyball insider, Andrew Schneider. But Dean and Sam, let's get right into this Baylor game. Just a very surprising game from Iowa State. The last two games that we saw them play, you know, Oklahoma State and Kansas State, really Iowa State did not play well. But this game was a brand new Iowa State team. They looked re-energized, refocused, and they were led by Steel Jantz, who had a record-breaking game. He had 36 completions and five touchdown passes. Dean, what made Steel Jantz so effective in this game? Really, uh, it was a combination of things. You have to say Baylor's defense literally ranked uh, last in the country, but that doesn't take anything away, I think, yeah. from what Steele did. Uh, he had a great offensive line play, gave him all day to throw, but he just went out there and he looked confident. He looked comfortable. He was in the pocket. He was able to step up, uh, make those throws, and, and that was a thing that was very different from the games that he struggled in is he had time to throw the ball. He had, you know, he had plenty of time, found a lot of receivers. I, th I, just, I just think he looked comfortable. That was yeah. the main thing, and Rhodes addressed that after the game. He said he looked comfortable in the hotel, mm -hmm. said he looked comfortable on the bus, said he looked comfortable in warm-ups, and, and, and he was confident going into the game. Yeah, and the story coming into this game, one of the two stories, was who was going to start at quarterback for Iowa State. We didn't know until game time. Obviously, Coach Rhodes told us yesterday, he knew Friday evening who was going to start. He told Steele mm -hmm. he was going to be the starter, but... We didn't know who was going to be the starter coming out. We didn't know if it was going to be Steele, Jared Barnett, or even Sam Richardson, who hasn't started a game this year for Iowa State. Mm -hmm. But I thought that Coach Rose, I thought he was going to go with Jared Barnett. I know Sam and I talked about this last mm -hmm. week. We both thought Barnett was going to get the nod, especially the way he played um, against TCU. I thought that was a big game for him. But then comes out in the first quarter, looks good against Oklahoma State, but after that just really did not look comfortable back there didn't look natural mm -hmm. and coach Rhodes said hey it's an open quarterback competition coming into this week just as it was the week before that and whoever was going to pl whoever played better in practice this week mm -hmm. was going to get the starting nod so Sam Steel Jans was do you think that obviously coach Rhodes made the right decision but is he the quarterback for Iowa State going forward it sounds to me like it's just going to be a week to week thing it okay. really depends on who gets the best week of practice in who is the most impressive there and it sounds like Barnett had two very bad weeks of practice mm -hmm. Steele really stepped it up was getting most of the first team reps so it's honestly the way he's so up and down mm -hmm. it's really just a week to week thing and for Steele Jans he's a guy that can be so effective on the ground make, making mm -hmm. space for himself which he really did he took advantage of a weak Baylor defense as you yeah. alluded to Dean mm -hmm. But Iowa State had 10 receivers with catches. And for a team that had, I think we counted, what, was it eight drops in the first half, first quarter maybe, mm -hmm. even alone? These, these receivers really stepped up, and they were led by Jarvis West, who really had a great <laughs> game for Iowa State with seven catches, 99 yards, and three touchdowns. So, Dean, talk about the receivers for Iowa State against Baylor. I thought it was just so interesting because Jarvis West, no career touchdowns heading into the game. He catches three yeah, that, against, that, against Baylor. It was so funny because Sam and I were talking about that. We are like, was that his first touchdown? I think it was. So then he goes and has three and yep. two more after that. He has seven catches, 99 yards. All three touchdowns were the first of his career. I thought it was really just a, a, a testament to actually how deep this receiving core is. They, they are really underrated. Mm -hmm. They don't have Josh Lenz. He was a game-time decision heading into the game. They gave it a go in, in warm-ups, Rhodes mm -hmm. said, and he wasn't able to... As he said, I believe the ball was out in front of him, and he wasn't able to go get it. So you have you have Lens out of the game. You actually have uh, Aaron Horn, who struggles. I believe he had, wasn't at five drops in the first half. Yeah, just yeah. He, they said he had cold hands, you know, something like that. But deep receiving core, they really stepped up when they needed to, and certainly they were able to take advantage of this Baylor defense that that really struggled. Yeah, and in losing Josh Lens, not having him in this game, I thought was going to really hurt Iowa State because he has been so you know effective this year, especially against a weak defense. Mm -hmm. I thought he was going to be the big player going to down the field, uh, like we saw against TCU to start the game. But when you look at guys like Albert Gary, who had a mm -hmm. great game for Iowa State with 76 yards receiving and a touchdown. And I think that wasn't that his first touchdown of the year, too. I think a lot of guys got in the mix. Ernst Brunn had a great game. And Chris Young, who's had a few uh, flashes of greatness this year, too. But mm -hmm. you look up and down the line, and these guys just coming in, having big catches for Iowa State. And it wasn't just them on offense, too. The, the running game finally got mm -hmm. things going for Iowa State. 176 mm -hmm. combined net yards for Iowa State. Just all around, Chanchel Johnson, 73 yards. Uh, Steel Jantz ran for 54 yards. And James White also had a good game coming off an injury. Mm -hmm. So... Talk about the running game a little bit, you guys. Have, what what made them so good? And was it just the weak Baylor defense that made, was so effective? Well, I mean, last week we really talked a, a ton about the fact that 
coming into the game last week, mm-hmm. Rhodes said he wanted 200 yards rushing, yet the running backs only had 11 carries. And those two things did not equate whatsoever. Yeah. In this game, the running backs had 32 carries for 176 yards. Yeah. I mean, that's the key to success right there. I know Steele had 52 pass attempts, yeah. but when, when he's able to have that success on the ground behind him, mm-hmm. it really takes the pressure off him, and I think that's a huge reason why he looked so comfortable yesterday. What I want to highlight is, is the offensive line. I tried to allude to it to Rhodes uh, last night, but, but the reason that they were able to run the ball, like you said, 176 yards, throw the ball 52 times, they possess the ball almost twice as much if, as, uh, as Baylor, and that's something they weren't able to do yeah. earlier on in the year. So I want to credit the offensive line because they gave them the ability to run the ball, Mm -hmm. gave them the ability to pass it, and and that was, like you said, that was the key. That was the key. Yeah, no rushing touchdowns for Iowa State. Mm -hmm. All five passing touchdowns. So it wasn't that they were creating big holes down in the red zone, but they were allowing Steele to have time in the pocket to make decisions. I remember one play in particular to Jarvis West where Mm -hmm. Steele Jantz was pressured in the pocket, escaped a tackle, and really just looked all down the field, looked at every re- possible receiver, ended up finding Jarvis West, who made a beautiful play, slipped a receiver in the back of the end zone. Really just a nice mm-hmm. decision-making by Steele Jantz. And that's something that, okay, we saw a couple turnovers by Steele. Okay, we had it. We saw him have an interception. You know, we, had, we saw him have um, another t- another turnover the in the game. The fumble. The, game. the fumble late in the game. But so we saw we saw the steel dance that we know who, who can make turnovers. He's he's only human, you know. Sure. But but he threw five touchdowns. He really took advantage of a weak Baylor defense to me. Well, it, it, I would argue that this might be the most complete game that he's had as a Cyclone. I mean, yeah, first you Big look 12 at, win. Exactly, his first yeah. Big 12 win, and you go back and look at that Iowa game. Everybody remembers that game. That game is legendary as yeah. far as the rivalry goes. But yeah. it was his most complete game. He looked comfortable from beginning to end, and. We talk about it week after week. When Steele's in there, he never looks. He ne- never looks like he has that total confidence, that mm-hmm. total comfortability, and he's yeah. just. But in this game, it was there the whole time throughout. He was making all his throws, 69% completion percentage, mm-hmm. and there was eight drops. I mean, that could have been well into the 70s. Yeah, and we talked last week about what Iowa State was going to need to do against this high-power Baylor offense. This defense really stepped up. They had four turnovers, held Baylor to 21 mm-hmm. points, a team that was averaging over 40 a game. That's mm-hmm. really good stuff. Um, I, we said, I said last week, if Iowa State could hold Baylor to under 30 in the first half, that they'd have a good shot of winning this game. They did just that. Mm-hmm. They did that by a long shot, too. And I thought that they really stepped up. And they were led by Jake Knott, who we weren't sure was going to play this game. Mm-hmm. You know, second in tackles for Iowa State. I think he had nine in the game. So really good stuff from him, too. And the whole defense combined just really stepped up with big turnovers, too. I thought it was just a really a testament to what type of a player that Jake Knott is. He's a stand-up guy for your program. Yeah. He, If there is any guy on this team that you want to be the face of your program, it's Jake Knott. Yeah. He comes into the game. He's not hampered by his injury. I mean, I mean, we don't know what he was feeling, but he played as if he wasn't, as if he wasn't in much pain. Mm-hmm. But like you said, they turned over Baylor. That was their big thing coming into the game. They wanted to turn him over. They got an interception from Florence, and they did their job. They held him to a season low 21, 20 points. I believe that ties their season low. Mm-hmm. But but the way that they shut down, which was what what was ranked as the top offense in the country, yeah. that's just a testament to what kind of a defense this is. This is an underrated defense. Mm-hmm. They don't get as much credit as they deserve. Yeah, and Iowa State really could have got down early in the game. You know, mm-hmm. the, they start with the onside kick, doesn't go their way. Baylor drives down, they're in the red zone. Iowa State defense comes up with a big turnover on that forced fumble. So I think that really, Sam, set the tone for the rest of the game on defense. Matt, we talk about it every single week, man. This defense, the way they play keeps the the team in every single game, and you just wait game after game for the offense to come out and play at least decent, yeah. and they get the victory. And this was, this was the game. It finally – the offense was able to produce and not so much reliance on that defense to win the ball game for him. You finally saw that. Yeah, everything seemed to just come together for Iowa State offensively and defensively. And I think that I think you guys would probably agree with me that this defense is playing well enough that Iowa State can beat any team in the Big 12 right now. And they definitely got a big test next week against Oklahoma coming up. And I think that that game is huge for Iowa State. I was saying that this game against Baylor was going to be the biggest uh, – the, it, it wasn't the it wasn't a must win game for Iowa State, but it was the biggest game of the year in terms of getting the team going, getting some momentum going for Iowa State, and I think they really just needed to get this game, and I think it came at a really important time for them. Well, there was huge implications on yeah. this game because you looked at the schedule with this mm-hmm. game: Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas. Obviously, they need this win, the mm-hmm. fifth win, to get them closer, one win closer to that mm-hmm. sixth win for bowl eligibility. And like I said, that schedule's very tough coming up. 
Yeah, I mean, it was it, I, the way that I called this game before was I believe that if they won the game, it was going to help them get to a bowl game. If they lost the game, then it was going to be very, very tough because, like we said, Kansas, uh, I think they've lost close to 18 straight Big, big 12 games. Yep. That is, it's not an automatic check. No game in the Big 12 is. But certainly this game was, was a swing game. It was a swing game of what they were going to do as, for the rest of the year. Yeah, and obviously Iowa State's got Oklahoma coming up on Saturday. That's going to be 11 a.m. kickoff. We're going to talk about that game coming up in the next segment, guys. This was a good segment. I thought we really recapped this well. I thought that Iowa State really did play well in this game, and mm -hmm. they're going to need to play the same against Oklahoma. We're going to talk about that game coming up in the next segment. You're watching Cyclone Insiders. He's, he's been the voice, uh, if there is such a, a, a player with, with this particular team, of the defense. He's the one in the locker room uh, game day that, that uh, uh, is challenging them, is motivating them. Um, not that we, we don't have people capable of filling those shoes with, with, with A.J. And, and, and a number of other senior players on this roster, but he's, he's been that guy. Um, He's the kind of teammate that you don't want to disappoint. He's the kind of teammate that you want to play for. And, and with the possibilities in mind going into Saturday's game, I think that was largely the case by, by our guys. But, but big play interceptions, caused fumbles, recovered fumbles, uh, uh, drive stop and tackles and things like that. Uh, a two-time uh, elected captain by his teammates. Uh, a young man that really helped jumpstart this era uh, of Cyclone football. He's played through a lot of pain, um, which is a tribute to him, his toughness, and, and his overall selfless desire to be a team player. It was never, ever about Jake Knott. It was always about the Iowa State side. Welcome back to Cyclone Insiders. Matt Van Winkle, Sam Turner, and Dean burrell are going to join us for this next segment. We're going to talk about this Oklahoma game coming up on Saturday, guys. This is a very interesting matchup for Iowa State, a Oklahoma team that is 5-2 and two overall, 3-1 and one in the Big 12. And, Dean, we were talking mm -hmm. uh, during the break that you think this is an underrated Oklahoma yeah. team. Tell yeah, us why. I think it is because Oklahoma is this team, like you said, 5-2 and two mm -hmm. overall. Their two losses are to two top five teams. You're talking about Notre yeah. Dame. They lost last night. They let it get away in the fourth quarter. And then they narrowly let Kansas State slip away uh, mm -hmm. in at Oklahoma um, early on in the year. But those are two top five teams. So this is a team that right now they they got their tails between their legs after a loss of, to Notre Dame that, mm -hmm. that, quite frankly, they got embarrassed in the fourth quarter. But this is an underrated team. You've got Landry Jones. He was a Heisman hopeful coming into the game, or coming into the season, excuse right, me. Right. But they're high-powered. They are high-powered. Sure. They have athletes. I think that they are a little bit more athletic than Iowa State. They're more athletic than a lot of teams in the Big 12. And quite frankly, I believe that they're underrated and that Iowa State should be scared. Yeah, and I think that they're actually very similar, in a sense, to Kansas State because they average quite a lot of points. They're averaging 40 points per game this mm -hmm. season, only giving up 17 points on defense. And they've had a couple, only had two non-conference games, uh, blew out Florida A&M, so those numbers might be a little bit skewed. As you said, they played a tight game against Kansas State, mm -hmm. and that's what makes me think that these two teams are so similar in the sense that they've both got two quarterbacks that can really play. Obviously, Colin Klein for Kansas State and Landry Jones for Oklahoma, who's got 2,000 yards passing already mm -hmm. this year, 12 touchdowns and four interceptions. So what, Sam, is Iowa State going to do to have to contain Landry Jones? Is it, are they going to have to just, slow, just pressure him all day in the pocket, or are they going to have to get him in the secondary? They're going to have to continue to do what they do, and that starts with stopping the run. Make, make it so that Landry Jones has to beat them through mm -hmm. the air so he doesn't have any balance on offense. Mm -hmm. And I know Jeremiah George in, in postgame yesterday talked about it. He said it's the same defensive game plan week in and week out. Start with yeah. stopping the run, yes. make mm -hmm. the quarterback beat you, make him have to throw it. That's his only option, and they su see success every single week with that game plan. And I'm glad you bring up a guy like Jeremiah George because we didn't bring this up in the first segment, but Jake Knott, there's, there's stories flying around that he's played his last game as an Iowa State Cyclone at linebacker, and I think that's invaluable to have a guy like Jeremiah George. He hasn't played every snap this year. He's kind of that third linebacker that mm -hmm. they kind of mix in there, and he's going to have – if that's true about Jake Knott, if he has played his last game as a Cyclone, Jeremiah George is going to be the key player from this point on for the last four games for Iowa mm -hmm. State, who's really going to have to make a big impact in the secondary. I've loved what Jeremiah George has done. I've you're, been on, I've been on here before, Jeremiah and George. I've talked about Jeremiah George. Yeah. This guy was, was very underrated coming yeah. into the year. 
Except, except for the coaches. The coaches love this guy. They loved what he did in, in spring ball. They loved what he did in training camp. Mm -hmm. And what he, what he brings to that 4-3 that, uh, base defense is the speed that they didn't have last mm -hmm. year. He brings that versatility that gives them the ability to still be able to, uh, to cover wide receivers uh, yeah. out of that base defense. And, and like you said, he's, he's still a young guy. You know, he, he hasn't been out there too long, and, and he's just going to be incredibly key if, if they're going to lose a guy like Jack now, the face of their program. Yep, and Landry Jones is not the only threat for Oklahoma. Obviously, this team that averages 40 points per game, they're going to need it in other places. Damian Williams, the running back, has mm -hmm. got over 500 yards, seven touchdowns this year. Mm -hmm. And they've got, looking at their, their numbers on offense, they've got five guys with over 200 yards receiving it, which mm -hmm. really stands out for me. Kenny Stills this year has got over 500 yards receiving and four touchdowns. So they're going to be a threat on offense, yeah. and it's going to be hard to stop them. But Iowa State... As we saw last weekend against Baylor, did a really good job against stopping a high-power offense. They do have a great balance on offense, and that's why it's so important that they start with stopping the run and make just force Landry Jones to have to do it through the air. Yep. The other thing I want to touch on in Oklahoma, though, is their very underrated defense. You talk about them as underrated as a team. I think their defense especially is very underrated. Number two in the Big 12 in total defense, number two in scoring defense, mm -hmm. and number one in <laughs> passing defense. Mm -hmm. And we keep seeing that the teams that are able to play at least a little bit of defense in the conference see much more success than the teams that don't. Yeah. Perfect example was Baylor. Yeah, and I think this was a good test for uh, for Oklahoma last week as they played Notre Dame. It was a pretty close game going into that third quarter. I think Notre Dame kind of ran away with it late in the game. So Oklahoma really got a true test of what a good defense looks like in Notre Dame. And I think that Iowa State's defense could do the very same thing. I think that, mm -hmm. that defense could learn a lot about Oklahoma from looking at tape against, that Notre, against Notre Dame. I don't know, Dean, did you get to watch that game at all? Mm -hmm. Did you kind of see... Mm -hmm. Okay, so, but you know Notre Dame is a, a very yeah. has a very good defense, obviously undefeated this year. So I think that they can learn a little bit from that game. Yeah, I think uh, what what Notre Dame did was obviously they they took away the run, which is exactly. the number one thing. Yeah. But but Notre Dame's built a little bit differently. Notre Dame is built their front seven is built like the SEC. Mm -hmm. They've got Manti Teo, one of the first defensive players, I guess, aside from uh, Tyron Matthew last yep. year. That that really is an actual legitimate Heisman hopeful mm -hmm. this year. Iowa State's defense should take notes. Yeah, like absolutely. And I guess the question going forward, we haven't talked to Rhodes yet about this week, and I'm sure we probably won't hear from any of the quarterbacks this week. Mm -hmm. um, but who do you think should start for Iowa State? Obviously, Steele has a record game against Baylor throwing 36 completions, five touchdowns. But we, we, we don't know. Yeah. It, it, it probably will be his job to lose this week. I think if Steele maybe sure. has a bad week in practice, maybe Rhodes assesses that differently. But... I'm sure that's something we, something we can ask him this weekend that will unfold later in the week. But, Sam, who do you think should start for Iowa State in this game? At this point, I think you've got to stick with Steele Jansen. Okay. I don't know why you wouldn't base off of the game that he just had. Right, a career right. game for him ties Iowa State's all-time records in completions and yeah. touchdowns. Yeah. I mean, how don't you stick with a guy uh, after it a was game interesting. like that? Yeah, it was interesting against Baylor that Barnett did get in there for yeah. one series. And we think that was just part, part of the game plan, part of Messingham's. Um, strategy in that game was just kind of throw off the Baylor defense, throw in Barnett mm -hmm. in there once. But uh, Dean, who do you think should start for Iowa State? I agree with Sam. It, okay. it needs to be Steele. Okay. But here, but here's my point. Jance, they've said it week in and week out. They believe every time they see Jance in practice that he has the ability to go out and win the game for him. Yeah. But he can't turn it over. See, that's that was what was what ruined him when he when he fumbles the ball, when he throws interceptions, and 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 gives defenses a short field to defend, it, it, it gives them no chance. So yeah. Jance has the ability. We've seen it. We saw it last Saturday. We've seen it this year. He just can't turn the ball over. He just needs to be composed, I think, is the big yeah. thing. And hearing from the coaches and hearing from the, the wide receivers, the tight ends, that, that when Steele is at his is very composed back there is when he plays his best games. And he doesn't try to do too much. You know, mm -hmm. He just sits and he's still. He's, he's composed. Doesn't not trying to rush things. So right. I agree with you guys. I think Steele probably will be the starting quarterback coming out there at Jack Trice um, on Saturday. And guys, I want to get your quick thoughts here before we go to break. Who do you think wins this game, Iowa State or Oklahoma? I think Oklahoma wins okay. because they're too complete of a team. Now, we saw Baylor in this last game, all offense, no defense. Iowa State saw success. Oklahoma's different. Oklahoma has a very solid defense as well as a very good offense because of that. I mm -hmm. think they win the ball game. Mm -hmm. I got to take Oklahoma, too. Like you okay. said, very complete team. I mean, and you don't see that too often. You've got Landry Jones on offense. You've got Damian Williams in the backfield. And they have a big playmaker on, in Kenny Stills. Baylor's Terrence Williams tore up Iowa State's secondary. He was very quiet because he didn't score, but he had a very, very successful game. But like you said, Baylor didn't have defense. Oklahoma does. Oklahoma is one of the best teams in the Big 12. I still think that they're just on the same level as Kansas State is right now. Yeah, obvi yeah obviously a lot is left to unfold this week. Obviously mm -hmm. with Jake Knott, where it's still questions about him. And 
I'm sure the quarter. We're, we think that we all agree that the quarterback will be Steel Dance, but we never know what's going to happen this yeah. week. Obviously, we record this show on Sunday right after the game, uh, so we're not really sure what's going to unfold. But I'm going to go against you guys. I think Iowa State pulls out this game, and I'm going to tell you why quickly. Because from what I saw from Iowa State a couple weeks ago against Kansas State, I thought that they played well enough to win on defense. I think this offense has really turned turned things around. Based on what I saw against mm-hmm. Baylor, I think that they've got a game plan that they can go in each week and win. I think that if Josh Lenz comes back healthy this week, that just adds another threat to the receiving core. And I think these guys are playing with a lot of motivation right now. Obviously, we saw guys like Jarvis West get in there. That just builds him up even more because, you know, like we heard from Chris Young yesterday after the game, he said that Jarvis was getting down on himself. He wasn't didn't feel like he was helping the team. I think that's where a lot of guys come in. But when you have 10 guys make receptions, mm-hmm. get the whole offense involved, I think that just adds more momentum for that team. I think if they can get things going against against OU, I think that they have a great shot at winning this game. Definitely going to have to come out strong, though, just mm-hmm. like they did against Baylor. Going to have to have a good first half, keep things going. I think it helps that this game is at home. Obviously, it's another early morning game, kind of similar to what we saw against Kansas State. Mm-hmm. But I think Iowa State comes out on top. I think the defense stays strong. They're going to play a good game. Iowa State's going to win this one. I think it's going to be a very close game. It should be a fun one, though. I think it's less than a touchdown. Okay. I think it might even be a field goal to win this game. We haven't had too many thrilling games this year from Iowa State, with the exception of the Iowa game, I guess. So I think this is going to be a fun game. So you guys have got OU. I've got Iowa State. It's going to be a fun one. It's at 11, 11 o'clock on Saturday on ABC. Hope you guys watch that one. Coming up next, Dean, first of all, thanks for joining us again. No problem. Our, vol- <laughs> or our uh, football insider this year, Dean Mahogal, joining us. Coming up at the, after this break, we're going to talk with our volleyball insider, Andrew Schneider, talk about Iowa State going 2-0 last week. You're watching Cyclone Insiders. Cyclone Insiders. Talking Iowa State sports with Matt Van Winkle, Sam Turner, and Andrew Schneider. Game recaps, previews, predictions, and interviews with Iowa State athletes and coaches. If you're a Cyclone sports fan, tune in to Cyclone Insiders. A new episode every week on ISU TV, Mediacom Channel 18, and on your YouTube page, ISU TV. It's Cyclone Insiders. Welcome back to Cyclone Insiders. Matt Van Winkle now joined by our volleyball insider, Andrew Schneider, here to talk a little bit about the Iowa State volleyball team's big week. Went 2-0 and once again, Andrew. This team really seems to get, have things going the way they want, especially this late in the season. Obviously, the Big 12 schedule is ha- just halfway over now, just past halfway over. And Iowa State was able to pull out two big wins against two good Big 12 teams. Uh, Kansas, a team that they had lost to down in Lawrence earlier this year, and TCU, who they had already beat this year. So, Andrew... What's been the couple keys for success for the Iowa State volleyball team? Well, this team now looks like they're the preseason number two in the Big 12 that we had all expected them to be early in the season. I think they finally figured out and hit the rhythm that they want to, and they found the rotation that's working best for them. Um, they've had a lot of players in the back who have just been all season long, their defense in the back with a Hockaday and, and it's really been good back there. It's been really good with Han as well. Um, another player that's kind of stepped up is Janelle Hudson. And really, they finally found the go-to. And Victoria Hurt has become the go-to player. Christy said it uh, after both the Kansas game and, and earlier in the week that she has become that player that is really the go-to player now. Um, and you look up and down the line, there's players coming off the bench. And that's been another big key is that uh, Tori Canute came up huge in the Kansas match when they were uh, down seven. They were down seven twice in the third set, came back both times, almost won that third set. And a big part of that was Canute, who had a bunch of big kills and a big block as well in that match. And really, Iowa State's finally playing the volleyball that they're used to. They also played Texas very, mm-hmm. very well. In their past, really, six, seven matches, they have looked like a team that could really threaten this postseason. And it all really started, I think, Andrew, down at Texas Tech uh, when the team went down 0-2 down there and really was able to come back. And I think Christy really said that they're playing. I, I'm, remind me of what she said. Was it the, uh, that she had a good word for it. It was something intensity that the team had been playing with, uh, just really gritty performances by them. And Iowa State, I think, uh, down, they went down to Texas, as you say, go up, you know, go up 2-0 looking for that sweep and then get, you know, lose the next three. And I think that's another big, big, big uh, match for Iowa State in the sense that they know they can beat the best Big 12 teams. And they, you know, go down to Kansas earlier this year, early in the Big 12 season. But Iowa State really didn't have an identity at that point. You know, it was pretty, kind of a young team, you know, players in there that hadn't had a whole lot of experience. But that match and then Iowa State last week coming, uh, having Kansas come to Iowa State and able to get 
a, a, a three to uh, three to one win against Kansas, a ranked team. I think that's huge for them. Well, yeah, and the fact that Kansas really. It was a game that they probably could have ended up winning. They played pretty poorly, actually, in those first two sets against Kansas uh, back uh, when they were down in Lawrence. And then they came back and almost won that match. And really, it started, like you said, with that Texas Tech, Texas Tech match. And a couple matches before then, you started to see things kind of come together now. Jamie Straubing has been extremely consistent these past couple matches, just averaging right around 10 kills a game. You're looking at some of their other players. And really, the surprising thing is that we've had Mackenzie Bigby here in the studio. She's kind of quieted down a little bit. Right. And they've been able to do it without her. And I think if she's going to be able to pick it up, this team is going to look really scary to Texas when they come in back here to Hilton in a couple weeks yeah. and really these coming matches. And we kind of saw that against TCU. They, And we looked through the stat sheet. They really took it to TCU. Yeah, they really, in that last set against TCU, they only hit, TCU only hit .031, which is really not very good for a team that in the Big 12, obviously they're new and they're facing a lot of teams, a lot more talented teams than they were, they've been used to. Uh, than they've been playing before. But, I mean, Iowa State, I think you bring up a good point, Mackenzie Bigby, how they're going to need her, especially come Big 12, uh, the final stretch coming here and even postseason time. And the blocking has been there. That's the one thing I know you were going to touch on is that the blocking has really been there. Jamie Strauby, you know, she'd really been uh, struggling early this season. Tanisha Matlock has been playing well, just not great but well. I mean, good enough to, uh, to get by. But I think that the blocking, as you were going to mention, has been really improving for us State. Oh, and it has, and and that's really just been the really big key out there is that the block has been fantastic. Uh, they they've really improved on it, and I think that was something they had spent just hours and hours and mm. hours of practice mm. working on it. And it hasn't just been the two middles; it's really been a lot of good double blocks. Uh, Taylor Knut's kind of their go-to blocker off the bench. Uh, Tori's kind of her si or younger sister has been kind of the person who stepped in and done a couple of those, like we said against Kansas, and right. really. That block allows them to do so much. And really, the reason why Han and, and, and all those players in the back row had all those digs is because they weren't blocking. And, and it wasn't they weren't able to control as much off the net as they were now. Mm -hmm. And it's a completely different team now that they've added that extra element. Because yeah. they've had the hitting. The hitting hasn't been powerful. They aren't Texas. Yeah. But they're very crafty hitters. Jamie Straubey has probably the hardest swing on the team. Mm -hmm. But you kind of look at Hurt when she has those hard swings. They're good. But they rely on Hockaday to have those craftiness. But that blocking really sets it up. And it really allows them to hit from wherever they want. Because if they're able to control the other team, get in their head, mm -hmm. and make sure that those hitters aren't taking as big as swings, mm -hmm. it allows the back row to pass well. And it allows... Really, I think an overlooked aspect of this team in Allison Landwehr, who's who, who could be All-American this year with just how awesome she's been setting up all these hitters. This team, it, it's coming together. I know a couple weeks ago I was kind of doom and gloom about this team before mm -hmm. this big run yeah. and how they needed to improve, and they have improved on those things. Sure. In fact, they, they have proven now that they are not only a top-tier team in the Big 12. Mm -hmm. This team, if they can continue to gel and continue to grow and let these younger players like Malloy, like Hudson grow, this team could get that Final Four goal they were looking for. Yeah, and I remember the term that Christy Johnson Lynch used. It was competitive anger. And that was the, the word that she used after those first two sets uh, against Texas Tech. And I think that this team, after the, you know, they had a very tough non-conference schedule. And the team, I think, really just kind of got down. They weren't playing with that much intensity. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, Jamie Strauby wasn't playing her best volleyball. But I think they, the girls, especially the seniors, Landwehr, Strauby, really kind of all got together in uh, hockey day. Then they realized that they really needed to step things up. If they wanted a chance to win, get back, you know, make a, make a Final Four appearance, get it, you know, make, have success in the tournament, that they were really just going to need to step things up, uh, you know, bring, the, bring those bench players along, have them step up too. Obviously, Victoria Hurt, a very good example of that. So I think that... Iowa State can really just put things together that they're going to have a good shot at making a good run. They got South Dakota State. They'll be on the road. It's kind of a strange game, not a Big 12, non-Big 12 game for them. But uh, so they'll have to go on the road, play South Dakota State. Don't we don't really too, know too much about them? We'll f probably find a little bit more out this week. But that game is on Tuesday. It's at 7 p.m. Andrew, thanks for coming and talking a little bit of cycling volleyball volleyball for us. Iowa State going to make a big run here. I think that they've got things. Uh, coming together and it should be a fun season. Rest it should season. be it should be a very fun rest of the season. I can't wait to see how it uh, plays out. I also want to thank Dean Burhau Golf for coming on for the first two segments and talking some Cyclone football with us. I also want to thank Sam Turner. Join us again next week for another episode of Cyclone Insiders.